Hey folks, it's Rob, and welcome back to the Monstrous Compendium Appendix for the Mistara uh, setting. And we're still in the introduction, unfortunately, but I believe we are at a more interesting part of the introduction, as, albeit not as necessary as the previous one, as uh, this isn't about the stats we'll be talking about. But this one is now uh, more on DM tips, and then, uh, you know, some for further information on this setting. So, uh, without further ado, I will get started, because uh, hmm, who knows how long my, my voice will last again. Uh, but, <clears throat> DM tips, getting more for from your monsters. As a DM, do you worry about having too few monsters to keep players on their toes? Certainly, the AD&D game offers a dizzying array of creatures, and you can consult other monster-filled appendices, but consider this. Most action-adventure writers manage with just one monster to pit against their protagonists, other human beings. Even without hundreds of dragon species, writers of novels and screenplays find plenty of ways to entertain their audiences. That's because each human villain varies from the last. They are not cut from the same cloth. By the same principle, with a little innovation and imagination, even mundane monsters can offer new surprises. The following text offers suggestions for getting maximum adventure from the creatures currently at your fingertips. Alright. <clears throat> Monster names. The AD&D game rules use standard names for monsters. Much like scientific names in the real world, they define quite precisely what sort of creature is at hand. A green dragon, for example, has specific statistics and abilities. In the real world, however, many animals and plants go by different names in different areas, even when those areas speak the same language. In one place, a flower might be called hawkweed, and the same flower might be dubbed Indian paintbrush in another. Sometimes the name is not accurate, in the sense that the name might be used for two different things. The simple twist of names can enhance your fantasy game. As DM, you should keep track of monsters by their standard names, as listed in the rules. But from one place to the next, the next monster may be known by different names, and different monsters might be labeled with the same name. If in the monster entries in this book, numerous creatures are given alternate names. The Brain Collector, for example, is known on other planes of existence as Nehtsalagu, Thalgu, Thalgu, there we go, uh, which is thought to be the creature's own name for itself. Brain Collector would be a sort of name used by common people of the prime material plane. It describes the monster from a human perspective in which monsters' unsavory gathering of brains is the primary consideration. Characters who have traveled the plains, however, might call monsters Nethal Nethalgu. Neth Nethalgu. It, yeah, the, that one's a fun one to trip over, isn't it? Uh, I imagine the hipster inter interstellar travelers are using the Helgu, but yeah... I don't think your party's going to be into it. Brain guy. Brain guy. Be prepared for brain guy. <sighs> or imagine the village which calls local wyvern a dragon. The villagers have probably never seen a real dragon, but they have heard of them, and in their eyes, the descriptions of dragons match this winged reptile that steals their livestock. If the villagers persuade the player characters to rid them of the dragon, how will the expectation of a real dragon affect events? Will the heroes attempt to parley with the stupid beast and st interested only in sheep for dinner each, di each day? Will they expect a great hoard of treasure? For those of you who don't know, uh, wyverns, A, don't have the special intelligence of dragons, but B, on a physical level, they don't have... Uh, the dragons in this setting have forearms. Basically, you know, they have like, they're quadrupeds plus wings, right? Wyverns don't have the front arms. They just have the rear legs and the wings. 
And usually there's also maybe sometimes a uh, wyvern will have like a scorpion tail or a sting or stinger tail. Um, yeah, they're different. Um, wyverns aren't particularly, not necessarily uh, as dangerous as dragons. They like the breath attack, for example. Uh, and, you know, tend to be more animalistic, but they are plenty dangerous. If your players do not know exactly how, what to expect, the game will be filled with more suspense. Players who are familiar with the rules and monster descriptions will have to be a lot more careful, too. Another careful, colorful way to use names and monsters is to give individual monsters a proper name and a reputation to match. For example, perhaps little heroes learn of Arkathog the Hungry, an ogre whose name is used to frighten local peasant children who would rather not eat their vegetables. A monster with its own name, and even a reputation, is much more interesting to confront. Well, that's a fair point, I think. Certainly evocative, right? And that's not a handy tool to have in your bag, is it? Terrain Modifications Monster descriptions include a note about preferred terrain. You can get more mileage out of the monsters by adapting them to reflect different habitats. Some monsters in this appendix are examples of creatures that have been modified for a different terrain. The Velia is an aquatic version of the vampire, for example. Since vampires cannot cross running water, a new description was warranted to include appropriate modifications. Other monster descriptions include variant forms whose attacks reflect their terrain. For example, a marine decapus can make more tentacle strikes than a land decapus because the land decapus must use at least one tentacle to support its body or hang from a tree. Just because variants have not been provided for different terrain does not mean you cannot make them yourself. In fact, you should. Take a monster and give it white fur and other minor changes and you create an arctic variety. Take a surface animal or a fish and give it pale skin and blind eyes and you create a deep cavern version. Give a land monster gills and fins, and an aquatic variant springs into being. In many cases, the changes will be purely cosmetic. Coloration, fur, sometimes, as with Decapus and Velia, more substantial changes are required in order to, make it account, to, to account for the strategies and special strengths and weaknesses of the creature. In your notes for play, be certain to record such things. Substantial changes in special attacks, defenses, strengths, and vulnerabilities may also affect the XP value of the monster. Special Twists Face with jaded players, spice up existing monsters with special twists so that they are not what they seem. You can give monsters disguises, unusual appearances, special abilities, tools, weapons, or even the ability to use magic, creating humanoid spellcasters, for example. Look at the entry for... Agarat in this volume. Essentially, this is a ghoul with special twists. Note that a special variant can be twice as surprising to characters who have already encountered the normal version once or twice. Unique Monsters In myth and legend, monsters are often unique. Medusa and Pegasus were individuals in Greek myth, not monster types. Following mythic precedent, you can make up unique monsters of your own or decide that certain published monsters are unique. One monster in this appendix that might, for example, be unique in your game world is the Grey Philosopher. Consider the opposite situations. Option 1. Not unique. Here comes a Grey Philosopher. We pull out our plus two swords and attack. Well, okay. I mean... <laughs> uh, option 2. Unique. There sits Talarxis the Wicked, pondering the decay and fall of the centuries-gone theocracy he once ruled. The later choice seems to be much more colorful, does it not? I need to change page. Sorry about that. There we go. We're up here. For those of you who are trying to read along. <clears throat> Later choice, latter choice seems much more col colorful, does it not? Note that it includes a personal name following a tip described above. Combining these ideas is a good plan. Different interpretations. Many AD&D game monsters are derived from myth, 
legend, and folklore. These sources are not in agreement about their monsters. Just because the AD&D game adopts one interpretation of a mythical monster does not mean you cannot try others. When you discover different ideas about AD&D monsters, feel free to design your own variants. Special Tactics and Characterization Whenever possible, you should devise special tactics or characterization for any monster. Instead of drawing up your dungeon or wilderness and just noting the abbreviated monster to statistics, decide how each monster reacts to adventurers. What special tactics might it boast that have allowed it to survive this long? Taxic tactics that will make it difficult to defeat? Does it have traps? Escape routes? Special weapons or allies? With forethought, even a clever kobold could make an adventure in and of itself as it trips up the designs of the PCs. Many monster descriptions herein include detailed notes on how these monsters deal with their opponents. Do not be constrained to those tactics alone. Surprise your players. Limiting the cast. The AD&D game puts many monsters at your fingertips, but you don't have to use them all. In fact, there are some good reasons why you might prefer to limit the cast of monsters in your own campaign. A very real danger in running an AD&D game is that by having such a plethora of beasts, you will ruin a sense of realism in the game. This used to be a very strong flavor of Dungeons & Dragons. The kind of, despite this being a magical fantasy setting, it should have an element of reality, of realism, of how it should be cohesive and work and all hang together. The this is putting work into managing and maintaining that suspension of disbelief that your players have and yourself. Uh, that way, everyone's buying into everything that's happening instead of going, wait a minute, hang on, uh, no, mm -mm. you want, don't want those stalls, okay? Um, <clears throat> so... Um, back back to the, back to the reading. I'm sorry. Um, I'm easily diverted, and it, you know this is somewhat fun for me. So, um. <clears throat> remember the food pyramid. There are thousands of plants, plenty of herbivores, and far fewer predators. They don't mean the U the the U USDA food py pyramid, by the way. Different food pyramid. More more biology. <laughs> right. Fewer still would be the creatures that only eat beings high on the food chain, such as humanoids. By this reasoning, the most vicious monsters in your world ought to be the rarest, and they compete fiercely for a limited food supply. This means that the creatures are not well adapted, will succumb to extinction, or at least live in marginal ecosystems, the border areas where they may have some special advantage, while those best adapted will tend to flourish. Look at the Sprackle, a bird described in this appendix. It appeared recently on Mistara, created by a magical circumstances. Its lightning bolt ability makes it more powerful than the birds that compete for its ecological niche. In the present, there simply are not enough of this new species to go very far, but as sprackles prosper and reproduce, they will spread. In due time, they may drive a more mundane species of bird into extinction. A DM who does not want the sprackle to become a dominant species should decide that some special vulnerability limits the bird's number, perhaps a virus that does not affect normal birds, or an unusual predator that gains sustenance from the sprackle's inherent magic. If you limit the range of monsters normally encountered by player characters, you can use the ideas outlined above to make individual encounters more interesting. And when the PCs meet something unusual, perhaps a monster from another plane, or a creature flourishing in a marginal area or lost location, the encounter will have greater impact and significance. Other Monsters of Mistara are at the top of the second column now. As noted above, many common monsters from the Monstrous Manual inhabit Mistara. In some cases, however, the Mistara name is different, such as name changes. Uh, such name changes appear below, with the Mistara name listed first. For complete information on each monster, see the Monstrous Manual. So that was 
the main monstrous manual uh, compendium output that came with the second edition. Uh, and I do have a copy of that on the shelf. And actually, I had to have the binder over there on the other book bookshelf. But um, basically, these are the more general monsters that you would have already encountered outside of the, spo outside of the Mystara setting. Uh, so, uh, first item listed here is Beholder, comma, Aquatic. The monster manual Eye of the Deep is simply called an Aquatic Beholder on Mystara. Blast Spore. The Mystaran Blast Spore is most commonly corresponds to the standard AD&D game fungus, the Gas Spore. So, Blast Spore, Gas Spore. Hmm. Devilfish. This is the Mystaran name for the... Oh, geez. Uh... Ixitzactyl. Is... Ix... It's Ixit... The... Ixitzactyl. Ixachetl. Ixachetl. There we go. Got it. Ixachetl. Oh, sorry. I'm usually pretty good at working out names right away, but uh, uh, no, new world ancient name basis really does kind of trip me up a bit, especially that kind of Aztec Mayan approach. Um, <clears throat> dragons. Many dragons that inhibit other worlds that inhabit other worlds, do not appear on the planet Mystara. For example, the gold dragon is the only metallic variety found here. See the dragon entry in this volume for further details. Hmm. I'm going to go with Hau? Hau? H-A-O-O-U. So that a O O would normally be an U, and then we have a U, and... Hmm. Wow. Uh... How? How? Uh, mm. I don't like it. I need a pronunciation guide. Mystarian aerial servants refer to themselves by this name. Mystarian natives usually call them aerial servants. <sighs> oh, jeez. Mm. Hook beast, comma hook horror. Okay. Mystarians use the hook horror and. See the Hook Horror and the Umber Hulk as closely related beasts. This may confuse travelers from other worlds. It will not be immediately clear which beast is being described. And then we have the Hook Beast, comma, Hulker. The Umber Hulk is called a Hulker on Mystara. As mentioned above, the Hulker is considered a member of the monster family that includes the Hook Beast. Killer Tree. This is the Mystaran Hangman Tree. See plant, comma, intelligent in the monstrous manual. Lamara. The monster Mystarans call the Lamara would be considered a Lamia noble elsewhere. Other Lamia varieties are apparently unknown here. Mesmer. The Mesmer is a Mystaran sea monster that is very similar to the Morkoth. They share the traits of hypnosis and spell reflection ability. However, the Mesmer is an undead creature, and the Morkoth is not. Perhaps a group of undead Morkoths were stranded on Mystara from another plane long ago. Few visit the ocean depths these monsters claim as home, and fewer still have returned with tales of them. Necrozon. The Necrozon is identical to the Catab... Um, uh, come on, Rob, you know this one. Catoblia... Catobalpaz, 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 Catobalpaz. There we go, Catobalpaz. Sorry, we're going to be getting this a lot, I imagine. If this, is, if this is too much for you, I understand. Um, It's been great. Um, And, you know, I'll miss you. But uh, I'm going to press on. Uh, whether this is wise, I don't know. But, I mean, you know, I'm a... I've lived a life. <clears throat> On Mastara, Catobalias, uh, Catobal, Catobal Paz, is considered an archaic term, the sort of thing one reads in crumbling manuscripts but rarely hears in conversation. Yeah, I like Necrozon much better as well. <clears throat> Salamander. The Salamander, described in a monstrous manual, is a creature of flame appearing from within an, the entry for elemental fi kin, comma, fire. 
The frost salamander is a mastarin creature, so named because its natives consider it an ar arctic variant of the flame salamander. Sphinx. The monstrous manual includes several subspecies of sphinx. Mastarins know only two, the two genders corresponding to androsphinx and gynosphinx of other worlds. However, mastarins called both variety sphinxes. One is simply male, the other is simply female. In fact, in Broken Arrow, you can play a sphinx. Yeah. I, I know. The, the rules are complicated. Um, honestly. Um... But yeah, you can. They have a variety of options for player character monster creatures that live on the top ballista kind of flying city thing, and yeah, sphinxes are a possibility. Uh, Sashai, double S and H A I. Uh, this is what Mustarian invisible stalkers call themselves. Among Mustarian natives, invisible stalker is a more common label. Label, yes. You don't say. Strangle vine. This unusual plant is the choke creeper described in the AD&D game under the heading plant, comma, dangerous. Yeah, the game's got a variety of dangerous plants. That completes the introduction. As we're only 21 minutes in, I believe I'm going to continue with our first monster, which we have pictured here. Ah, uh, so we have a vaguely Latinish name here, uh, A C T A E O N. Now, my initial interpretation, and hopefully I can make my tongue cooperate, is Acteon, which I think is correct. Um, if you have other ideas, please feel free to express them in the comments below. I am. Open to correction, honestly. <clears throat> so, the Actaean is a uh, temperate forest creature. Uh, rare. Tend to be solitary. Uh, activity cycles during the day. They are herbivores. They are very intelligent. Their treasure type is P or B in a layer. Uh, alignment neutral. You get one appearing. AC three. I would just take... Any AC presented for any monster in here, I would just take straight if I was running a D&D &D game and using these monsters, okay? I would just take that AC and take it over straight. Same goes for hit dice. Just take it over straight. Uh, movement 15. That needs a little translation, I suppose. Movement rates in Dungeons & Dragons tend to be in, uh, first off, in combat and out of combat, right? And we did get into that a bit uh, in the errata previous episode. Um, this is a relative speed rating in this game. Um, so I would imply that they are fast. Uh, as slow humanoid creatures move at like 9. Uh, and a human moves basically at 12. Right, so uh, if you put a zero next to that 15 and call that like, you know, a, 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 a turn's movement, that would be probably appropriate in translation. Uh, these are AC3, hit movement 15, hit dice 11, Thacko 9, that's a n 9 or better on the D20 to hit AC0. Keep that in mind. Um, number of attacks, they get 3. Damage for attack, so uh, they wield a spear, apparently, which they get two attacks on, d6 plus 6 per hit. Uh, they're 2d8 for antlers, and, you know, they look like these kind of deer guys. They have antlers. Uh, special attacks are polymorph breath and summoning. They have a camouflage special defense. They have no magic resistance. They are nine feet tall. Large. They have champion morale, which means functionally they won't break without penalties. And since they're alone, you're, you're, I mean, basically, they're not... 
they just die, right? Uh, XP value 4,000. That's a lot of XP. Uh, XP values are different in uh, second edition AD&D versus, say, like Dungeons & Dragons and that. Uh, defeating monsters was de-emphasized in Dungeons & Dragons versus collecting treasure. A solitary being, Nectaeon is a protector and hero amongst wiggling creatures. Some Mistarans call it an elk centaur, because, like a centaur, its nine-foot-tall body combines human and animal elements. The Ectaeon has the torso, arms, and facial features of a human, but the antlers and lower legs of an elk. Brown, elk-like hide covers its entire body. Elk centaurs speak their own language and the sylvan woodland tongue. Some also speak common. Combat. In combat, these creatures are formidable, boasting a number of special tricks and abilities. It is no wonder that other intelligent force beings regard them with awe. The Actaeon can camouflage itself perfectly, as if invisible, in light or dense woods. When angered by the wanton slaying of woodland creatures or similar vile acts, it springs out of hiding, usually with a surprise. Opponents suffer minus five penalty to their surprise rolls. This fearsome creature attacks with large spears made out of wood and bone and gores enemies with its antlers. Its incredible speed enables it to make two spear attacks per round. Given its massive strength and great size of the weapons, each spear inflicts 1d6 plus 6 points of damage. I, this also implies to me as the Dungeon Master that those spears can't be readily used by the player unless they have basically superhuman strength, right? Not an 18, but like a 19, right? Uh, and that can be achieved with certain magic items or potions, at least temporarily. But yeah, uh, they won't be able to just pick up the spear and use it is my, my interpretation, or at least not without penalty. Certainly not to the same effect, right? But your game, your, game, your rules, right? <clears throat> A powerful magical breath weapon complements the Actaean's other capabilities. Once per day, it can breathe out a warm, greenish mist, filling a 10-foot by 10-foot by 10-foot cube. Anyone within it must make a saving throw versus breath weapon or be polymorphed into a common forest creature, taking on the creature's intelligence and habits, as well as its looks. Common forest creatures include owls, squirrels, deer, boars, and the like. So they don't become... They don't become Bardool the fighter, but a badger. They become a badger. Just to be clear, they don't just look like a badger. They are a badger. This change is permanent unless countered by another polymorph spell or by a dispel magic cast at 12th level or higher. If the saving throw is successful, the transformation still occurs, but it lasts only 24 hours. So they get to go back to being, you know, uh, what's it the fighter, right? Uh, probably without their equipment, I would imagine, because, I, I don't know, maybe they polymorph back with their equipment. It is magic, you know. Your call. How much do you want to penalize them? Up to you. This breath weapon can be used once per day. Also once per day, the Actaeon can summon woodland creatures to assist it. 1d6 creatures arrive in 1d4 turns. Choose from the list below or roll 1d6 to determine if a creature type at random. As the number, numerous aforementioned powers weren't enough, a few venerable Actaeons are druids of up to 8th level ability, though such individuals are quite rare. So we have a table at the bottom there. And I'm just going to skip to that for the moment since we were just talking about it. And, you know, might as well just be on top of it, right? Actaean Woodland Creature Summoning Table. So on a 1, boar. 2, bear. 3, centaur. That's not a common woodland creature, unless it is. I mean, how would I know? 4, griffin. 5, lizard, chameleon. And 6, Treant. Wow. That, that, and, hmm. Imagine just summoning uh, 1d6 treants. 
Well, you would roll each one, but still. Habitat slash society. Actaeans live alone, except during the mating season, oh geez, which occurs in the spring of every third year. Following autumn, a female gives birth to a single fawn. The fawn remains with her through the winter, learning the basics of survival, how to forage for bark and twigs, how to shape spears and other basic tools, and how to use sharpened sticks and bones to dig edible roots from the ground beneath the snow. Many fawns starve or freeze during their first winter or fall prey to an attack. Survivors set out on their own come spring, each pursuing its own solitary existence. Actans have an eye for treasure, and they collect small hordes in secure, well-hidden locations, <clears throat> such as the hollow trunk of a fallen tree or beneath a rock. And intel as intelligent creatures, they know others also value coins and jewels. Actans often trade their riches for tools and, if nature is harsh, for food in the dead of winter. And you got some hooks there. Admittedly, not without any work, right? Uh, you could imagine that there's like a fawn trying to get by in the harshness of winter that your party encounters. How, how do they react? What do they do? It, maybe it's being attacked by a wolf or a pack of wolves, more likely, right? Individual wolves tend to be not too aggressive against anything. It looks like it might be able to, to be a danger, but a pack of wolves... A pack of wolves can get up the gumption to go like, hmm, we got this. Ecology. Actaeans belong to a woodland community that includes centaurs, dryads, and similar creatures. Because Actaeans are bold and rare, other forest folk consider them heroes. Actaeans sometimes work with druids to preserve the safety of the woods, especially to thwart a serious danger. Well... Certainly not something I expect the party to really be taking on on a regular basis or, you know, at all. Uh, you know, fairly lawful and not, you know, it, it's neutral, admittedly. Uh, but, you know, it, it seems to be not interested in whopping, whomping your party unless your party's been, like, you know, desecrating the forest. Um, yeah, it, it's neat. And I guess we'll we'll stop there since uh, we're over a half hour anyway, and my I can feel my throat getting s scratchy again. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Uh, probably more listening in this case because I mean I don't even have my hands waving around in front of a book, but um, I appreciate you being here and listening to me stumble through words. I hope you have a great day. Goodbye.